And first this morning, we have breaking news. The State Department is ordering families of U.S. Embassy staff in Ukraine to begin evacuating the country as soon as tomorrow, with expectations that the U.S. will encourage all Americans to leave Ukraine by commercial flights, quote, while those flights are still available, one official said. The Biden administration sent 200,000 pounds of lethal aid to Ukrainian soldiers over the weekend, with more arms from the U.S. military stockpiles expected this upcoming week to fight a potential Russian invasion. An attack could be imminent after Vladimir Putin amassed 100,000 Russian troops on the Ukraine border, and Joe Biden seemingly gave Putin an opening to do so during his speech on Wednesday. My guess is he will move in. He has to do something. I think what you're going to see is that Russia will be held accountable if it invades. And it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, et cetera. Joining me right now is Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. He sits on the Senate Judiciary and Armed Services Committees. And Senator, it's good to see you this morning. Good morning to you. Thank you, Maria. Good to be on with you. Are you expecting Russia to invade Ukraine? Well, Maria, Vladimir Putin has certainly set the conditions to invade. This is the most dangerous uh, time in Eastern Europe in years, maybe decades, to have t a major war between two nation states. Um, I, I think we should take a step back, though, and ask ourselves how we got here and why it matters. Vladimir Putin has said that he can't tolerate Ukraine joining NATO. That's a pretext. There's no plan for Ukraine to join NATO, or that he can't accept large numbers of American combat troops in Ukraine. That's a pretext as well. We've never had large numbers of combat troops there, only a few trainers from time to time. What he really wants is to reassemble the greater Soviet Russia empire that he thinks it was a geopolitical catastrophe when it collapsed in the 1990s. And he wants to have uh, a non-democratic buffer zone. So the Russian people can't look to places like Ukraine or Georgia and say, if democracy works in those countries, why shouldn't it work in ours? That's why what Vladimir Putin has always wanted, though. So why is it that now he's put more than 100,000 troops on our border? And, and there, I think President Biden bears a lot of the blame. For a year, he's been appeasing Vladimir Putin. Uh, he gave him a very one-sided nuclear arms control treaty the very first month of his presidency. He removed sanctions from the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia to Germany, which his own party opposed. He really did nothing about the colonial pipeline hack. And then, of course, in August, Vladimir Putin, like the rest of the world, saw Joe Biden's debacle in Afghanistan. So that's why Vladimir Putin thinks the timing is right here and why this matters for the American people. It is very dangerous when you allow our adversaries like Russia and China and Iran to try to upend the status quo, and all we do is have strongly worded speeches or some mealy mouth sanctions. So if Vladimir Putin can get away with this in Ukraine, what does that say to Xi Jinping about what he can do in Taiwan, or what he can do to threaten our military positions in the Western Pacific, what he can do to continue to ch cheat on trade deals to take jobs and wealth away from this country? That's why the American people care about what happens in Eastern Europe, is because it emboldens and encourages our adversaries everywhere if we simply look the other way when Vladimir Putin might invade Ukraine. Yeah, I, I want to get to China and the Taiwan potential in a moment, but let me stay on Eastern Europe for a moment, because n not uh, sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 pipeline basically gave Europe this dependability on Russia. I mean, Germany now needs that gas from Russia. Will Germany stand in the way of stopping Russia from invading Ukraine? I'm afraid they might, Maria. This week, Germany has not only refused to provide Ukraine with anti-armor and anti-aircraft weapons, they're actually blocking other NATO countries from providing those weapons to Ukraine. Uh, this is in part because Germany is now so dependent on Russian gas. Look, Germany made extremely poor policy choices about energy over the last decade, shutting down all of its nuclear power plants, for instance. That made them even more dependent than they already were on Russian gas. Now, with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline going through the Baltic Sea, you're in a situation where Germany has secured its energy supply without taking into account the consequences they'll have on countries not only like Ukraine, but NATO allies like Poland. Russia is now going to be able to turn off the gas to those countries in the winter 
with no consequences for Germany. That means that the German government will be much less likely to take a firm stance against Russia. This is just another example in the long line of bad decisions and appeasing decisions that the German government across two different administrations has made towards Russia. Well, what about the bad decisions we've made, frankly? I mean, we've got oil prices now back up to $86, $87 a barrel, uh, gasoline up 60 percent year over year. And we, too, the United States, is depending on uh, oil from Russia because Joe Biden canceled yeah, the and XL pipeline and, and moved the priorities toward electric. Yeah, Maria, what's happened in Germany over the last 10 years is really a cautionary tale about what would happen in the United States if we implemented something like the Green New Deal, because as you say, we've already reduced our energy independence, uh, and therefore we haven't been able to export more of our energy. What we should have been doing is producing even more oil and gas and turning some of that gas, for instance, into liquefied natural gas, which we could then export to Germany. So Germany would have a reliable energy source in the United States as opposed to depending on Russia. Senator, what, what about the timing? Do you think Putin is imminently going to invade, or does he need more time uh, before invading uh, uh, Ukraine? What are your thoughts on timing? Maria, I think he could invade at any moment. Um, I, I think probably according to all the reports I've seen, he's probably maybe one to three weeks away from being fully prepared, having all the combat enabling troops that he needs, for instance, so say Medevac and Kazovac on the border. Uh, he may also want to wait a little bit later into the depths of winter when the ground is more fully frozen for ease of maneuver for tracked vehicles like armored personnel carriers and tanks. I don't think we can be complacent, though, and think that we have a week or two weeks or three weeks. This could happen at any moment. This is why it's so important mm. that we be clear about the kind of sanctions we would impose on Russia's oil and gas and mining and minerals uh, industries, how we'd cut them off from the international banking system, and that we all continue to try to provide the weapons that Ukraine needs to defend itself. And, and why would he say it depends on what kind of incursion is it, it is? If it's a minor incursion, the U.S. might act differently. Are his, are his intelligence uh, staff telling him this? Was this a conversation he had with Putin? I have no idea why Joe Biden would say something like that in public. I mean, it could be a, a blunder of historic proportions, much like when Dean Acheson said that uh, our security perimeter didn't include South Korea and a short time after North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950. Um, there's a reason why Joe Biden went out and cleaned that up the next day, why so many of his under, underlings tried to clean it up over the next 24 hours. But unfortunately, Vladimir Putin saw what the rest of the world saw. When Joe Biden was speaking off the cuff, spontaneously, he said that a minor incursion might divide NATO and might make a response harder. When Joe Biden was speaking off talking points or when his press secretary was speaking, it was a different tune. But I, I think Vladimir Putin mm. knows what Joe Biden really thinks. It's when he's speaking spontaneously. Senator, I want to ask you about China. Let's slip in a short break. Then I want to get into domestic issues. Joe Biden said the upcoming midterm elections will only be free and fair if the Democrat voting bills pass, forcing the White House to walk back those words as well. We'll talk elections, economy, and the broken Biden agenda with Senator Tom Cotton when we come right back. Stay with us. Do you still believe the upcoming election will be fairly conducted and its results will be legitimate? Well, it all depends on... Uh whether or not we're able to make the case to the American people that some of this is being set up to try to alter the outcome of the election. I think it easy to be, be illegitimate. President Biden questioning the legitimacy of the upcoming midterm elections. According to Rasmussen's daily presidential tracking poll, Biden's approval rating tumbled to a new record low of 20% following that solo press conference this week. Just the second press conference of his administration. I am back with Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. And, Senator, so now I guess it's okay to question the legitimacy of an election. Now we can. Yeah, Maria, I think you and I are both old enough that we can remember when you question very risky, dangerous practices that were put in place in 2020, that it was an insurrection and endangering democracy. 
Um, what Joe Biden is complaining, though, is not about restrictions on the right to vote. States have not restricted the right to vote. They made it easier to vote in many cases, but just harder to cheat. He is simply trying to cover up for what I think is going to be a disastrous election for his party because of his failed policies and rising inflation, rising crime, and a chaotic southern border. Uh, he's trying to find excuses in advance for why they are about to be uh, beaten very badly at the polls in November. Will they be able to get their voting bills through at this point, or is that dead? And what about the rest of the agenda? Are they going to come back and try to get through some kind of a massive spending plan uh, at some point in the next couple of months? No, Maria, they're not going to pass these election takeover bills. Um, we were able to defeat them last week uh, with all 50 Republicans united and Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin standing up to the radicals in their own party, even though they sponsor the bills, refusing to break the rules of the Senate to change the rules of the Senate. So I suspect they will come back to their massive $5 trillion spending bill. Joe Manchin uh, said he couldn't support it in its current form last month. Um, but I think they're going to try to take another run at hundreds of billions of dollars of spending on climate change and green energy. And as we discussed earlier, that could have devastating effects not only for jobs and prosperity in our country, but also for our energy independence. Uh, and also, uh, it's going to have very negative effects on inflation, which is where they should be focusing. I mean, the Biden administration is suffering right now in part because they're not focusing on Americans' priorities, like getting inflation under control or getting shelves restocked, stopping the crime that we see in so many cities and getting our southern border under control. That's where Congress should be focusing. Yeah, and I spoke with one CEO yesterday who told me that the chip shortage got worse at the end of last year, and we are going to have a very tough year in terms of the supply uh, shortage and the disruptions that we're seeing. Uh, there are some people now expecting a recession because of all of these issues. I know that the Biden administration is trying to push through new nominees, and he is nominating Sarah Bloom Raskin as the head overseer of banks, and he's making climate change, she wants to make climate change a key priority for banking. Will she get through, do you think? Well, I hope not. And I hope that President Biden pulls back all of his nominees to the Federal Reserve because they've had a record of failure now for the last year in trying to keep inflation under control. But as you say, Sarah uh, Bloom Raskin, or for that matter, Lil Brainerd, who at a, at a hearing in Congress wouldn't even answer if she was a capitalist or a socialist. They're not going on the Federal Reserve to fulfill its core mission, which is a stable monetary supply to have stable prices and get inflation under control. They want to use the Federal Reserve to impose climate change policies on private businesses. Oftentimes, they're acting in concert with major Wall Street banks. Uh, you know, BlackRock, for instance, just sent out a letter to its CEOs and companies in which it invests, saying, if you're not engaged in woke uh, policies in your company, we may disinvest. This is all really just a kind of domestic American version of the social credit store scores which the Chinese Communist Party imposes on its people. Government and big banks working together to try to enforce woke social and economic policies on private businesses. Well, it's actually quite extraordinary. You mentioned BlackRock. They are perfectly fine operating in China. Uh, they've told their investors to up their investments in Chinese companies by three times, and yet they are attacking American companies for fossil fuels. Last time I checked, China was the biggest polluter in the world. I've got to get your take on China. A moment ago, you said, you know, what will this Ukraine situation mean for Xi Jinping as he eyes uh, Taiwan? When do you expect China to invade Taiwan? Well, I think Xi Jinping believes today that his military is capable of, invade, of invading Taiwan. They can execute that operation if he gives the order, if America doesn't come to its support. Now, there are reasons why he might not do that imminently, like the Winter Olympics that are coming up, um, or the Party Congress later this year, in which the Chinese Communist Party will give him an unprecedented third term, uh, third five-year term in power. Uh, but after that, I think when the geopolitical conditions are right, maybe when the light and weather data is suitable in the Taiwan Strait, if, especially if Vladimir Putin pulls off an invasion of Ukraine, you could see Xi Jinping go for the jugular in Taiwan. That's why it's so important that we stand by our commitments around the world and that we be especially clear that we will come to Taiwan's support to defend its democracy and its autonomy.
And real quick before you go, Senator, you were among the few who wanted a total boycott, not just a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. We're about to talk with Ennis Freedom coming up. Do you worry that our athletes are going to be under uh, a, a pressure in any way? Gordon Chang said that the CCP is going to try to get their DNA. What are our athletes about to face? Yeah, very much so, Maria. Last summer, I asked the Biden administration their plan to protect our athletes and coaches and staff from things like DNA harvesting under the guise of coronavirus testing, for instance, or around the clock electronic surveillance, or just outright arbitrary detention and hostage taking. The Biden administration had no answer for that. So a couple months ago, I called for a complete and total boycott. As these Olympics approach, my fears are growing. You know, China is requiring all persons coming to the country for the Olympics to download an app on their phone, which has all kinds of back doors to it. They recently arbitrarily arrested and detained one of their own most famous tennis players. If they'll do that to one of their own tennis players, what do you think they'll do to an American athlete, especially if that American athlete of speaks up for, on behalf of, say, Tibetans or Hong Kongers or Taiwan? I, I I think it's wow. very dangerous to send our athletes and coaches there. These Olympics should be postponed anyway because of the coronavirus raging across China. That happened in Tokyo Olympics. It's yep. a much, much smaller set of Olympics. These can be rebid yeah. and conducted a year from now. Wow. What incredible story playing out here. Senator, it's great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. We so appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Maria. Senator Tom Cotton.